You have found Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. We're locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie. Oh, what else we got here? Downloadable audio episodes can be found in the podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. Today, we're welcoming slash preparing to learn from Paul Barron, the founder and CEO of The Wall Printer. And I got to say, before we get started, Paul, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but I had a printer repair company and we'll call it a previous life. It was a while ago. So when I saw your company come across my desk, I'm like, I got to see what's going on here. Because I had a hard enough time fixing printers that printed on paper. Printing on walls, I can imagine, is a whole new game. So welcome to the show. Thank you, James. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and your audience and uh, introduce for anybody who cares to listen uh, information about the wall printer. It is, a, it is not a new technology. It's been around for about 15 years. Uh, oh, wow. But I brought it here to the United States as it was invented overseas. Um, and I brought it here uh, in 2019, late. Started the business in 2020. Um, basically with the mission to create business opportunities for people who are either into wall art um, and floor art, because we have floor printers as well as wall printers. Mm. Uh, but the, the overarching uh, mission was to create business opportunities for people that either had some type of a business where this could add revenue and benefit them, or people looking for startup and interesting new venture on something new and cool. They were willing to take the risk if that's the right term, even though the business has been around for 15 years and has about a thousand companies using wall printing machines, uh, it was totally new in North America and South America, which are the markets that I service. And uh, it is uh, an interesting way to put wall art um, onto any wall surface, indoors or outdoors. Pretty cool machine. Yeah, sounds cool. So I'm going to throw out a guess that the window we see behind you has been printed on that wall. Is that right? So, so I never know if I'm talking to an audio only audience or if uh, you have video. We got uh, but, both. Yeah. But so for those that do have video um, and for, for those who don't have video, I'll say just go to thewallprinter.com. That's our website. Mm-hmm. Um, and that will 15 seconds on the website will tell you everything you need to know about what our machines do. But for those of you with video, yes, this is a cinder block wall in my warehouse in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, this is where we manufacture and, and uh, test and deliver machines and prepare them uh, for customers. Um, and we ship throughout North and South America, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but this particular wall art is done on a cinder block wall. So you can see also, I'm a little Zoom challenged when I point. But the, <laughs> right? uh, we all are. Um, all the, the, you could see the grout between the different sections of cinder block. So, and what I, and the reason I point to that is the wall doesn't have to be smooth. It just has to be vertical. We don't print on curved surfaces. This is not a replacement for vehicle um, wraps where you have artwork on cars and fenders and curved surfaces. Mm-hmm. Um, it is designed for any wall, any wall surface. It could be cinder block, brick, wood, um, metal, tile, glass. Uh, there's no surface we won't print on as long as it's vertical. And then if it is horizontal, like a floor, we do have a floor printer that could print things like logo art or a company's logo or a sports team logo on a basketball court or somebody's personalized parking space in a garage. Then you would use the wall, the floor printer for that. Um, but it's very high, um, resilient, brilliant color, um, UV Um, inks they're called, which are like an acrylic ink, very hard shell ink that dries instantly with all machines as it prints. Um, And the machines are designed to print anywhere from small text to large murals. There's no limit to the height and no limit to the width you can get. So we got a lot of ground to cover. We got the business side. And I want to talk to you about the technical side of the wall printer. Because what you just described there is inks and stuff like that. You blow my mind a little bit from what I knew from. Yeah, so, so it, again, and, and I apologize. I tend to drift um, into different areas. No, 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 no. You're all good. You're all good. We got a lot to cover because essentially this is uh, what I would consider to be something new, even though it's uh, 15 years old or something like that. Yeah, um, there's, 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 a, there's only literally a handful, five companies in the world that manufacture these types of machines. 
All right. Um, and there's two in China, one in Germany, one in um, Australia, and one in India. And there are, and when I first discovered this, I was actually approached by one of our competitors today, a German product. And no disrespect to anybody in your audience with German heritage. Um, I drive a BMW. I cook with <laughs> I cook with Henkel knives, which I think are the best in the world. Um, I love my car, but just because something says made in Germany, I learn after doing my homework. I learned that that doesn't mean you should charge maybe twice or three times or something else at comparable <laughs> value costs. Sure. Um, sometimes you get that value, sometimes you don't. In the wall printing game, I learned early on after being approached by the German company to market their products here in North America, which is what I do. That's my background is I take foreign companies products that are interesting to me and I help them find their audiences, vendors, partners, bring those companies to exit usually or to partnership with other US based companies uh, mm -hmm. that might serve the audience and the product better by manufacturing here in the US or um, setting up offices here in the US. That's basically what I've done. And I usually did this on a commission sales job, but early on years ago, um, I stopped doing that. And I only found interesting products that I was willing to invest in, that I was willing to put my money and mouth behind, um, as well as um, then encouraging other people to use these products for either their business, their service, their um, a way to either make money or to utilize these products. So when I found this product, well, they found me, um, I couldn't make the deal with them, but I was intrigued by the product. I had never seen a vertical printing machine before. That's the generic name for these products. And so uh, they wanted me, like all these other companies, to be a commission salesperson for them and bring their product to market. Um, I wouldn't do that. I wanted to buy the company. I thought it was so interesting. Um, but uh, the conversation broke down. But then I said, let me take a look at this a little bit more closely. And usually when I say to my wife and I'm in my home office and I'm surfing the internet like we're on today, and I say, hey, Maureen, my wife, come on, take a look at this. Rather than come into my office and take a look, what she do usually does is cut up my credit cards and hides the bank account because, <laughs> because she says, oh, here we go again. Paul's going to invest in something crazy. Um, and so this time she looked at it and she was all in as I was. Uh, but we wanted to know, well, what's the best comp best product to use um, if we're serious about this? So I did my homework. Same homework I asked my customers to do. Do your research, do your due diligence. So I went around and I looked at the other four companies besides the German company, as well as analyzed the German company's product. And I wanted to see what the differences were, what the opportunities were, what their customers were doing with it. Can, in fact, somebody make money with this machine? That was the first and most important question. Yeah, right. Um, That's a good one. Then all the technical aspects, you know, how reliable is it? You know, what does it do that the other ones don't and all this kind of stuff. And so after going through all this, and I'll try to show up in the story for the benefit of your audience, because I can get long winded when I start talking. <laughs> uh, I, I basically found that this one product that I found from one manufacturer in China was the most feature rich product It did things that the other ones, including the German product did not do. I was able to get it at half the price. Um, so I was able to create a really good value and business opportunity for people. Um, and we were able to engage with one another in a very strong relationship um, that, um, that guaranteed not only product and service and support for me as I needed it, but also the tools I would need that if down the road I wanted to actually manufacture these machines um, here in the United States and, and have more control over the future um, availability of the products for the benefit of my customers that I would be able to do this. And so this company ticked all the right boxes. It's been three years now. We went from zero to right now we have about 110 customers. We are adding one to two new cu customers every single week um, who purchase a machine and or exclusive territory because the thing about something new, um, I want people to be rewarded if they are willing to take the risk and be the first kids on the block, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. to be a wall printer um, or a floor printer, depending on what machine they buy, if not both. Um, and so we, we provide exclusive territory rights to people that allow them to uh, service their markets without interference from us selling to other people. Because when people see these printers out there in the street, they're like advertisements. They're very cool to watch print a wall like you see behind me with artwork. And when they do print, people say, hmm, that looks interesting. Maybe I'd like to be in that business. But the ones that raise their hand first, they get exclusivity for their territory. Where we, are. we are not a franchise. We don't reach into people's pockets and take royalties like franchises do. We mm -hmm. don't restrict them on the name of the product and how they market it. 
um, we just agree not to sell to anybody else within their territory. And they are obligated to purchase one printer initially and then more over time, um, depending on the size of their territory. And okay. that size territory goes by population. Then is the ink proprietary to the machine or tell me about that? So yes, so, so as much as I, like pretty much everybody else in the world who hates the fact that when Hewlett Packard Epson or Brother or <laughs> Canon makes you buy ink from them, and there are remarketed inks that you can buy from other companies. Oh yeah. Provide several things. But if you know printing, like apparently you do have some experience with, I had absolutely none. So mm. I learned the hard way by saying, hmm, can I get cheaper or different ink and put it into these printers? The answer is no, you cannot. The, the printers, the software, the technology, the component parts, our print heads, which are Japanese manufactured, they are the best print heads in the world. They come from either Epson or Rico, which mm -hmm. are the two two best companies that manufacture print heads for all sorts of printing machines, but specifically mm -hmm. for the wall printing, vertical printing machines, these print heads require a very special kind of ink. Now, with that said, this also speaks to the relationship I have with the manufacturer of the machines. We actually manufacture our own inks here in the United States. Because oh, you we do? Want to make sure we, uh, I have a factory in Kansas and another one in Florida that all manufactures right. inks to all specifications. And we went back and forth with the factory to assure the fact that the software, the hardware, everything interacts properly to make sure that these colors are reproduced faithfully to the digital image that was created by the artist or downloaded from the internet. Um, our machines require a vector image, um, meaning that if people are not familiar with that term, uh, the difference between a vector image and let's say the photo you take on your phone. I could take a beautiful picture of my dogs um, and put that up on the wall, but it'll only enlarge to maybe three feet by four feet before it starts losing resolution and looking mm -hmm. really badly. Um, pixelating, if that's a term that more mm -hmm. people are mm -hmm. custom, comfortable with. But a vector image, when created, because that's a digitally created image, you can enlarge that to any size at all, and it'll still look beautiful and perfectly proportioned. And so those are the types of images our printer wants. It will print a JPEG, but a JPEG, as I said, will only enlarge so much. So right. a vector image is what we want. And those are readily available. You can download vector images from sites like shutterstock.com um, mm -hmm. or they can be created in Adobe Photoshop or Corel Draw, the tools of the trade of the graphics artist. Um, and, uh, and that's what our machine you know, thrives on. It takes a vector image, you put it on a USB stick, you put the USB stick into the USB port in our machine, then the software we provide takes over, imports the image and prints it on a wall faithfully. Does the wall itself, the, the wall that you have behind you is white. So does the wall have to be white or does the printer print white? It's, it's almost like, and I apologize to your audience that thinks I've prepared your questions, but that was a great one. And well, that was a big deal when it came out on posters when Epson, I think, I don't know if they were the first, but they were, it came out where they could print with white ink. And that was like, whoa, so that wasn't I, that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. And I appreciate the question because that's what separates our printer from these other four in the world that I kicked the tires on before deciding on this particular machine. Our machine is the only printer and I'm a co-owner with the patent, which is also very unusual for an American company to be a co-owner of a patent with a Chinese manufacturer. That mm -hmm. speaks two things. Number one, to answer your question, we are the only vertical printing machine in the world that will apply white ink behind the image to allow it to print on a dark wall or on glass or on something where the inks will still, colors will pop out beautifully. Now in an image like, and the other half of that sentence before I get to this image and the white ink um, point you raised is that it speaks to the relationship between me and the manufacturer. There, it's very rare that an American company will co-own a patent with a Chinese manufacturer, but it speaks to the relationship we have as I insisted upon this feature being something that would separate us from the pack, so to speak, and allow us to really give value to our customers, as you enthusiastically mentioned. So a print like <laughs> you see on the wall behind me, this mm -hmm. wall was cinder block, which everybody knows is kind of comes out gray concrete. So mm -hmm. it's primered over with white, with white paint. The okay. wall printer is not a wall painter. You don't paint big blocks of black or blue or white with the wall. You go ahead and you take a brush and a roller and you go ahead and you prepare the wall, whether it's wallboard or sheet rock or whatever. You prepare the wall first and then you print your image. An image like this one, which has a lot of white in it in the window frame mm -hmm. and in the molding around the windows and the clouds in the sky, there's no ink being used in this print. This print has, it's a five foot by eight foot wall mural that has about $10 worth of ink in it. It's 40 square feet. There's about 
15 to 25 cents per square foot is what the ink cost is in this. So it's about $10 total ink. However, if this was a blue wall or a black wall, then in Adobe Photoshop, which is the only application we don't give because it's readily available, you license a copy of Adobe Photoshop, our customers are requested to do that. And you put that on the computer outside of our machine. Mm -hmm. And then it has a very simple feature to apply white behind the image. Mm -hmm. And so our machine will print white behind the image. So if this was a blue wall, this image would look exactly like what you and your audience are seeing today. Everything else would be blue, but the white would all be just as white as you're seeing it now, but it would be with a blue background that would not bleed through like these other printers would have. If these other printers had a black wall behind it, it would bleed through and these windows would not look pure white. With our printer, they look pure white. Interesting. And that raises the ink cost. If it's a blue wall and you're printing with white ink, it might make it 45 to 50 cents per square foot per total sure. as opposed to 25 cents if you add white to the mix. Right. So then you're doubling or more so the cost. Exactly. Sure. But our, our printers will print about 15 to 20 square feet per hour. So this 40 square foot print took about two hours to print. Um, All right. Typically, our customers charge their customers anywhere from $20 to $35 per square foot, depending on the wall and the preparation and other things mm -hmm. that are involved. So something like that might cost a customer about $800 to put that on their wall. Okay. Tell me about the texture, because cinder block's not exactly the smoothest thing in the world. So this is an inkjet printer, basically a vertical inkjet printer that sprays ink out. So as I mentioned, it doesn't have to be smooth. It just has to be vertical. So in all those areas... Our technology provides um, ultrasonic sensors which move the, move the print head on what we call the Z axis. If you remember from your old algebra days, you had X and Y, mm -hmm. Y being vertical, X being yep. horizontal. And this also has Z, which goes horizontally in and out from the wall. So wherever there's a crevice, it automatically moves in. And where there's not a crevice, it moves out. Now, wow. let me qualify this so your audience is really understanding and expectations are set properly. It is not designed to go around obstructions in the wall. Mm -hmm. So if it's a crevice like you see here, or if it's a recessed door or a garage door that has panels that might be recessed a half an inch or something, yes, it will move and fill that in so it'll still look like a beautiful image. But if there are obstructions like uh, like on a container, um, on, a, on, a, um, uh, on a truck um, or on a, on a a box container or something, even a light switch on a wall. If there was a light switch in the middle of this image on the wall, you would have to remove that light switch before printing it because it won't go around anything that's protruding from the wall. All right. So that's yeah, that the, makes sense. a recess, no issues. So the, the print head knows it's got some sensor to know for the grout lines and all that in the center block and knows exactly. to move that. Wow. That is impressive. Yeah, it comes with two different types of technology on the printhead, actually uh, three. Um, one is a positioning technology, which is a laser pointer, kind of similar to what a, um, a, a gun sight might have. Mm -hmm. where you, uh, like an, it's like an X that's in red and it shines out onto the wall and that positions you where you want to start or if you stop and you want to get back to the same spot because mm -hmm. these printers will do a continuous print even if you stop or go away or go to the bathroom and you stop printing or you want to stop and it's a big print and you come back the next day, you can pick up right where you left off. It's not like a paper jam in your desktop printer where you have to start all over again. Yeah, um, wow. It'll, it'll continually print where you stop. Um, but so that's the laser pointer. Then you have the two ultrasonic sensors. That's what moves the machine in and out horizontally to compensate for crevices um, in the wall or any type of slight obstructions. Um, it'll print on a panel truck, for example, or like a, um, a trailer that as long as the seams are relatively flat, it'll go around a rivet on the surface, but it just won't go around something that's protrudes like, you know, a half inch or more from the surface of the, of the, sur from the surface. All um, right. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that, that, and then the third technology is the UV lamps, which cure the ink as it prints the instant it passes over the image vertically, you could put your hands on it and it'll be dry to the touch. Um, it's that's done with curing instantly with a UV heat lamp as it prints. The, the downside of that technology is that it, it results in the printer printing a little bit more slowly than some printers or paintings might do if you just have a brush and then you sit back and you wait for the paint to dry. This dries instantly, which is, and the reason for that is we want you to be able to print on any surface at all, but mm -hmm. you do sacrifice speed to some extent. 
Sure. Of course, this image here, five feet by eight feet, 40 square feet, our printers printed 15 to 20 square feet per hour. It took about two and a half hours to print this. Um, but if it, um, it would take a painter probably a day and a half, two days. <laughs> yeah, it depends. So it, it's fast, but it's not, you know, it's not as fast as let's say your, your desktop printer or a print or in a print shop, one of these $150,000 flatbed printers that are used for printing posters and poster board and signage. And uh, vinyl stickers and things. Well, like I was that. gonna say I fixed quite a few Epson banner printers back in my day. Now, granted, this is in the neighborhood of ten years ago with the most recent, and they weren't exactly speed demons when you had the resolution bumped up. Yeah, no, they're they're not, um, and and also you're also very limited in size for those machines, mm -hmm. as opposed to ours that can move along a wall, and there's really no limit. There's also no limit to the height, even though the machine is designed to fit inside of a standard U.S. eight foot room. The overall mm -hmm. height of the machine, from floor to ceiling, uh, with the tracks or wheels that it comes on to propel it automatically left and right, um, the machine. Um, is designed, as I said, uh, with a height of about seven feet, 10 inches. So it fits inside of an eight foot ceiling room. However, it does come with a one meter extension. So if you don't have a ceiling issue or you're in a higher ceiling or outdoors, it'll print as much as nine feet um, in image print height. But then there is no limit to the mural you could print if you think for a moment about window washers on a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. Just like a window washer has a scaffold and they erect a scaffold and go up floor by floor, you could do the same thing with a wall printer. The technology that comes with a wall printer allows you to what we call stitch images, where one image ends, another image can start. So you can have oh, wow. one, one big 50 foot tall overall mural um, but of course, then you have the expense that you pass through to your customer. Sure. That if you're, a, if I have end users listening to this broadcast, that you would have to pay for scaffold rental and the time it takes to do all that, and a forklift or a high low that brings the machine up to each level. So mm -hmm. it's an expensive project. Not what I would say should be the first thing that a customer of mine takes on when they first get their wall <laughs> printer. Sure. We call that an advanced skill. Uh, but the printer is perfectly capable of doing that. How? Just, I guess I want to talk about the mechanics of the printer itself because this is fascinating to me. Because one, when I was working on machines, everything was printing horizontally because gravity came into play with the, the way that the ink was set up to spit out of the print head. Correct. And just, I mean, paper, it was a lot easier to print horizontally than it was vertically. So how were you attaching this machine or printer to the wall that's temporary, but still it's got to be strong? So or a, stable it's a, if it's printing so, that high up. So there are two things you mentioned there. The one, which is the easy thing, the inks. The inks are gravity fed to the print head. Mm -hmm. And so that's the same in our printer as, as most other printers as well. Even though there are motors that kind of draw the ink through at the very beginning for maintenance purposes, purposes to make sure that the inks are flowing properly through the print head. There are mm -hmm. no clogs or anything like this. There's regular daily maintenance you need to use on these printers to make sure that the colors are all firing properly. Simple process, but it's part of that whole gravity fed issue of inks going through tubes in the printhead to make sure they don't just sit there for days at a time and have the opportunity to clog up. Right. So there's that part of it mechanically. But then um, also when you have uh, the inks and, your, um, and the sensors that move the inks in and out from the wall, um, the walls do have to be level. So there, there's leveling that's required. Um, these printers do not print on a, on a big incline if you want, um, because the, the motors are driving the horizontal, the X movement of the printer across the wall. And so we do, you want to have a level picture, you want to have a level floor. And so there are tracks that come with the printer that can be leveled. Um, or if you have a perfectly flat wall, the printer also comes with wheels that will self propel the machine across a vertical, perfectly flat concrete, wood, uh, flooring, um, if it's on uh, outside on pebbles or grass or plush carpet, then you want to use the tracks to make sure that mm. it moves consistently. But all of that is covered with the hardware you get with our machine. All right. Tell me about the print heads themselves. I imagine those have to be replaced every once in a while. So, so uh, these are, these are again, not, um, manufactured by us. They're manufactured by the Japanese printhead companies like Epson or Ricoh. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. These are the world leaders in printheads for, for uh, inkjet printing machines. Those are the types of printheads we use. They have a life expectancy from, for regular use with regular use of about two years. 
Um, if you don't maintain them properly and they clog up beyond repair, you might have to replace them. They are, in fact, the single most expensive component of the machine. Um, they cost about $1,225 to replace one of these printheads. But at the same time, um, we also if we also provide in our delivery, in our um, package, when our customers get it, they get a backup printhead included, because even if they do something or it's damaged for any reason at all, we want you to be able to continue printing. So we always give you a backup printhead. And our machines come with a warranty that if there is a defective part, not because you don't maintain it properly, but because it's, whether it be a computer board, a pulley, a cable, or a printhead, no matter what it is, that's covered under warranty. Um, the so the, is there a separate printhead for each color? So with our printer, no. Um, okay. The Epson printhead has been designed. It's got like 140, 140 or 170. I always get this confused. I think it's 140. Yeah, um, just make up a number. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, it, don't quote me on it, but it is either 140 or 170. Um, that's the number of holes that the inks will travel through to print the image. Mm -hmm. And so one printhead, based on the software, the way we've designed it, which is the priority software, allows all those colors to mix properly through one printhead. Okay. Rico print heads are only for single colors. Got um, it. And so we are experimenting with them, but that really adds to the price of the machine. And we haven't discovered any quality or maintenance benefit yet to be able to use, utilize that versus what we've got. Um, it may, by separating the inks out, require less maintenance, but that hasn't been proven yet to us. Um, gotcha. But we're constantly experimenting because we always want to have the best balance of print quality with speed of printing. Mm -hmm. um, but today, the Epson printheads will fire all the colors. The Ricoh printers will, printheads will not. So back in my day, to be missing one of those 140, 170 jets on an inkjet printer was not out of the question. That's correct. And there were some machines that had the hardware and software that was smart enough to compensate for missing jet so, so that you wouldn't see the banding. So, well, so you understand great questions and, and obviously shows your experience with this by just using a word like banding. And for your customers who don't, or your customers, your audience that doesn't know what banding is, means if the printhead is going up and down and it's, and it's going through a, a swath of um, an area of print that you see kind of like a vertical um, loss of color, um, which can be caused by the movement of the machine if somebody bangs into it, or it can also be ca caused, as you mentioned, by print and the printhead losing some color through either a clog or through some other, um, some other fault of the printing process. Um, the way that we do it, of course, when you first start printing, you go through a print test, which actually you put a piece of paper because this is not self-contained like your desktop printer. You mm -hmm. physically take a piece of paper and hold it in front of the printhead and the printhead moves up and down and it presents you with those five color blocks, CMYK and white. So C right. CMYK is the acronym for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, and mm -hmm. then white also. So you get five squares. And if those squares are fairly filled, doesn't have to be 100%, 100% is ideal, but sometimes you will get a hole, one of those 140 or 170 holes that aren't firing properly. So that square might have a little gap in it. But when the image is printing, unless, unless you have a lot of those colors, a lot of those holes for the particular colors, not firing, you will get a good image because it, 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 you, you, you compensate with quantity what you might lose um, out of a, a, um, an intermittent clog that might right. occur. But then, of course, if it's too much and, and colors are falling out or you're getting banding, then you stop and you go through a clean process, which then pushes ink through, or mm -hmm. you go ahead and you draw inks through with a syringe that kind of pulls the inks through All and right. relieves those clogs. Yeah, I remember the, the vacuum pump that Epson's had and they're cleaning. Yeah, oh my gosh. and so the only difference <laughs> between our printers and their printers is that theirs are more self-contained. Um, and as opposed to having to take it apart, most of what you do with our print heads is external. You just go ahead and you take a, a, just tubes that you can just stick a syringe in and kind of suck that ink through. Um, as long as you don't, again, it's kind of a learned art on how to do it just enough to pull the inks through, but not mm -hmm. too hard where you'll actually damage the print head. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. The Epsons, I can't tell you how many Epsons I end up fixing because that ink would end up in a spittoon. And yeah. then once that spittoon is full, that ink's got nowhere to go. <laughs> so, yeah. 
There's quite a few people that reached out to me and said, hey, I have a pile of ink on my desk and I don't know. Why. <laughs> well, that that I, I laugh, but it, it, while it can happen, it doesn't happen because if you if you do the, the right maintenance and you use the clean procedures um, that are built into the machine. Um, and also we do provide you with gloves because some people don't you you might very well during the maintenance process get ink on your hands sure. um, or filling the inks you might get them if you're not careful on how you go from the big one liter containers of ink we supply because they're not self-contained cartridges like your desktop printer either or bags like some printers have this actually comes as loose ink in one liter containers and our our printers have 240 milliliter containers so if, if one liter into the 240 milliliters. It's a process that, while can be done flawlessly and cleanly, often <laughs> is not. And All so right. we, again, beyond the training we do provide with our printers, we do also provide those cautionary um, tools like gloves sure. and uh, and a little bucket uh, and bottles that you put underneath the printed so it <laughs> does spill. And and also we do encourage our print our customers to do practice printing at your location first on a piece of paper to make sure the machines are firing properly and the and the image is printing the way your customer expects it to um, so that before you go to that site you don't do a lot of experimenting or setup or maintenance at the customer site you do it back in your home turf and then mm -hmm. bring the printer to your customer and yeah you get the time the space and you time, can probably space, say a couple four letter make... words without anybody getting excited while you're setting it up right? exactly so tell me i guess from a business standpoint who is purchasing, uh, do you use the word murals? I don't know what you call them, prints? So so there's, so there's, I'll answer you two different ways because you kind of asked the question but gave an answer yourself of who our customers' customers are. Yeah. So at the wall printer, we're in the business of selling, servicing, supporting the success of our customers who are business owners who either have a business like, as an example, a painter, or a general mm -hmm. contractor who knows the audience. They've gone in, they've painted all the rooms eggshell white in a home <laughs> or in an office, and and but they've learned who those customers are. They might have some. They might have children. One is into sports. One is into um, Disney uh, or action figures or characters, cartoon characters, whatever. Um, and somebody else is into um, you know ocean scenes, and they want that on the wall. They want that kind of artwork, and so they learn who these are. So after going in and painting the walls, they now know they can add some more revenue by having learned who these customers are offer up some kind of artwork to put on those walls so that's so so those are are very successful customers of ours that already have an existing business then there are customers who are just um startups they see this as just really new innovative they like being the first kid on the block don't mind investing anywhere from 30 to whatever thousand dollars they want for an exclusive territory in a machine the machines start at 24 $25,000 and to about $29,000, depending on whether you have an exclusive territory or not, which is an additional fee. But without getting into that aspect of the business to answer your question, their customers then can fall into any bucket of residential, commercial, uh, schools, hospitals, medical offices, event spaces, airports. It really doesn't make any difference. There's no lacking walls in this country or any place else. <laughs> whether it, it, and, and again, who you market to might be determined by, do you have an existing business already? Or do you have a customer audience you want to focus on? Um, and, and so that's, that's really our customers' customers fall into any of those buckets, depending on, do they want to service residential markets? Do they want to service uh, commercial markets, restaurants, schools, whatever? Um, and they market to whoever they want to. Um, we don't, when, as I mentioned earlier, we're not a franchise. We don't reach into the pockets of our customers um, for royalties or anything like that. It's their business. We actually put their name, uh, their logo, their customer contact information of their website, their email address, their phone number. We actually print that on the printer themselves uh, on their customized cabinet so that when they're out there with this printer, because unlike the print shop that just delivers finished product, signs mm -hmm. or posters to people, we actually take these printers and go to the customer site. So people see these printers printing and they work like advertisements for themselves. And most of our customers, customers come from referrals from people seeing it and saying, wow, that's pretty cool. I have a wall or I know somebody who might like a wall printing. And once again, my long winded way of answering your question. No, it's all good. <laughs> that's a very good answer. Tell me, how do you market 
your business to the people, your clients? How are people so, finding you? Because I imagine so, yeah, not so, everybody knows that this is a thing. Well, so I'll answer that again in my un, my customary long-winded way. <laughs> um, so I wasn't the, the sharpest tack in the pack when I created this business in November of 2019, received my first shipment of printers from the manufacturer, um, all in Chinese, um, all without any kind of real support training or anything else in December of 2019. Mm -hmm. And then as we all know, in January of 2020, the world stopped with COVID and the pandemic. So here I sat with literally hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in creating this new business that I found so fascinating without the opportunity to tell anybody what it is or show anybody. <laughs> and nobody was traveling to Wilmington, North Carolina to see the wall printer uh, because nobody was traveling. Um, so that was all the bad stuff all the stuff that my wife, you know, was coming back to me and saying, I told you so. Um, but, um, <laughs> but I said, Nope, I'm all in on this. This is going to end at some point. So I swear everybody else was laying off people. I started hiring people and mm. I started hiring the technical team to translate everything into our markets, which was English, Spanish, French, Canadian, Portuguese. These are all the markets that I service North and South America. Um, and I started hiring the salespeople and the um, marketing people. First, the marketing people. And so to, this now is the answer to your question. We've used social media to let people know about what this does. We were able to easily show short video clips and let people see what the machine does um, so we can expose them to this in the, sh in the quickest, least expensive way. And that's the same type of marketing we encourage our customers to use in their local markets to introduce this. Um, show people what they are, to, you know, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, Reddit, TikTok, these are all the tools that very quickly can get um, something into market. In local markets, you can also, you know, use obviously radio and billboards and direct mail and these types of tools. But I chose to use the social media because it was the least expensive way to get the most impressions out there as to what this technology is and could do. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so that's what we did. And we did it for eight months before we got our first sale in August of 2020. Since then, we've added one to two wall printers every single week. And now we've got about 110 customers mm -hmm. um, and, they're, uh, and, and it's growing. And so we're really, really happy with uh, the customers we're getting. We're learning as we go along as to who's successful and who's not. A lot of people raise their hand because they think this is really cool and they don't mind spending and investing, you know, $30,000 in something, uh, but maybe they should or should not be in the business because they're only doing this part time. We want people to do this full time. And, to, and if they're not going to be the ones to use the printer, the best customers that we have are those that see this as a business to buy multiple printers over a period of time, grow mm. their markets, have people trained how to use these printers and do the marketing and service and support of those customers. Um, the best example of this printer being used day in and day out is going on right now as we speak in New York City, right on Madison Avenue, Louis Vuitton purchased one of our machines and is using that in an exhibit they have on 60th Street and Madison Avenue um, at an exhibition that is there until August 30, uh, just until December 31st. So it's only there for another two weeks now, a little bit more. But since October, it's been printing from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week in a window right on Madison Avenue of different images that reflect this exhibition they have, which is celebrating Louis Vuitton's 200th birthday. Um, and it's been touring the world. And now it's three months in New York City and they identified the wall printer as something they wanted to have right at the entrance to the exhibit on Madison Avenue, showing um, literally tens of thousands of people plus it's free admission to this exhibit. It was a tribute to Louis Vuitton and to creativity and to art. And uh, we've been printing day in and day out flawlessly um, for this exhibition. And, the, and it's one of the, and the reason I mention this is really because it shows the quality of the machine and the capability of the machine. And the fact that the more it's used, the better it works. Kind of like the expression, you know, race cars are meant to be driven. Yeah. These, are, these are commercial printing machines. And the more they're used, the better they will function for our customers. So yeah. get out and get customers and do a lot of printing. They'll be happy. You'll be happy. You know, it's interesting you say that the whole use it or lose it thing. Because I wonder the manufacturers of just about anything will put them put whatever their product their widget to crazy tests to make sure that it can survive but they never just set it on a shelf for a year and 
see if it'll actually fire right back up after that. Yeah, I mean, the, the worst, you know, I mean, our machines will will fire back up, but not if you just let it sit there with the inks in it. If you're going to go away, even for long weekends or, or you want to take vacation and mm -hmm. you're the only one using this printer, which again, we discourage, get mm -hmm. somebody out there. There's no lacking walls. You could be printing nonstop if you wanted to and getting jobs, but mm -hmm. look, not every business is going to be fully occupied all the time. And sure. if there are a period of days or weeks are going to go by that the printer's not being used, simply clean it out. It's an easy process. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, you clean out the machine with purified water, distilled water. You run it through after you pour out the inks back into the original containers so you don't waste your money on the inks. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you clean the machines out, then they can sit forever. And then when you're ready to start printing, you fill the cartridges with ink, you go through the original maintenance, and you're, you're ready to go again. Boom, um, ready but, to go. but we have proven that if these machines are used, they will function the best. All right. Tell me, you. Um, I want to talk about the ink just really quick a little bit more. Sure. Because it's fascinating. Is it like these walls are outside, I imagine. So fading, anything like that? Are there issues there? So if you were here at our studio here in our warehouse, on the outs, this is an inside wall in my office. Mm -hmm. Outside this building, we have three or four prints that we put on a wall that's actually south facing. Oh, um, wow. So it gets the afternoon sun. And in Wilmington, mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina, our summer days, we get weeks of 100 plus days. And right now we get nights and days that are in the 30 degrees. We don't get a lot of snow and a lot of freezing, but we get freezing temperatures. Um, not as much as you in Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> uh, thankfully. Um, okay. but, but we've gone through three hurricanes in the time that we've been open here since 2020. Um, so we've gone through three hurricanes and three summers, and we have prints that are as good today as the day that, they're, uh, that they were printed. Now, I, we tell people to expect two to three years outdoors, 12 to 15 years indoors, where the inks won't fade, crack, or otherwise deteriorate. Mm -hmm. um, but all of this does depend on the way you've applied it, on what the surface is, whether it's something absorbent that's a little bit better than maybe something like glass, which requires different types of treatment and different types of preparation. And you can also protect the images with um, a polyurethane um, type of a spray um, or coating that will even give it more resilience. Um, but yeah, it. it uh, it's rated by the ink manufacturers that mm -hmm. way. Um, so it's not anything that, you know, you know, people could say, how can you say that's going to last 12 to 15 years? You've only been <laughs> in business for three years. Well, that's because these inks are rated because they've been in business for decades. Mm -hmm. And they know that these inks will hold up under these conditions in that, in that manner. The printers themselves, though, should be stored at room temperature. So if you're not printing outdoors, and you can print outdoors in cold weather, the machines have a heating element that will keep the inks um viscous and loose so, so that they are fluid so it'll work in the printers um mm -hmm. even in cold temperatures or very hot temperatures but you don't want to really be printing in really freezing temperatures more for your own good than the printers yeah you right don't want to be printing in direct sunlight because sunlight is uv uv heat lamp well mm -hmm. it's like a uv heat lamp because it's uv light and our printers the inks cure with uv light being put on them from our printing machines and so if you're printing in direct sunlight, you could overcook the ink and that might cause the inks to buckle or deteriorate. So again, you want to cook in shade. You want to, if you're going to do an outdoor print in a very hot climate in Florida, maybe you want to print it at night. You know, no different than common sense, you know, when people fix roofs or do black topping of, of, of roads, you know, you do it at night. Yeah. Um, and uh, you use the same kind of common sense with printing. Or That's you print indoors. No sure. lacking walls, like I keep saying. You know, there you go. If, if the conditions aren't conducive, find conditions that are. Tell me about, I mean, guess printing on glass. That's pretty impressive alone right there. Yeah, we've got a few examples of that here. Our door just coming into our showroom, uh, which is the room adjacent to my office. Um, mm -hmm. That has a glass door, and we have our TWP and our, um, our contact information, website, and all that QR code all on the door there uh, on glass. And that's also an advantage of being able to print white behind the image because mm -hmm. we can actually print on reverse. So we've actually printed on glass inside the door, but it shows outside brilliant. Oh, wow. Um, because you, you, you print in reverse the image, uh, but outside you can see the image um, correctly um, and, uh, and it reads properly. Um, <laughs> but with the white applied behind it, it doesn't wash out from the light shining through the glass. And through yeah, the colors. that is 
So that's, a, again, an advantage of applying that white ink behind the colors. And uh, But yeah, you can print on glass. Glass, you just, the preparation for glass, um, unlike a wall here that you might primer at first, glass, you wipe it down with alcohol, you make sure it's dry and free of dust, and then you can print on it. That is slick. And it's t you can't scratch it off or anything crazy like that? No, no, uh, you can. And if you want to remove the print because you get bored with it or you want to go, you take a razor blade and that's how you would get gotcha. it off of glass or tile or metal um, off of this. You could either primer right over it um, and, and then print a new print. Uh, that's one way. Or you could sandblast it off or pressure wash it off. Um, those are the ways to do it on other surfaces. All right. Tell me about the floor printers. I guess we haven't talked about that. Is that more or less same the technology, same, except that... it prints on a floor rather than a wall? And same and that's ink, what, same ink, same technology, exactly. Um, right. So and, we can take and, the feet all over it on a gym floor or something like that. So it's... in fact, the first company to purchase this machine, which we 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 invented and created this machine uh, and made it generally available early two thousand and twenty two. The first machine to buy it was a one hundred year old uh, flooring company. And, um, and they, they found this machine because they would typically um, request, they had typical requests from customers to, because they would do a gym floor or they would do some, some outdoor patio uh, for people and, uh, or even interior foyer for an office building. And invariably they would want their logo or a sports team or something on that. Um, or they would resurface a garage and people wanted personalized parking spaces. Um, <laughs> and so, so they thought they saw our machine and they wanted to see if this would be a replacement for that the way they were doing it previously, which was very time and money consuming. Um, and so very labor intensive. And so they, they not only came and looked at the machine, but they gave us some floor samples of their materials to print on, then took it back to their factory. And they have five factories throughout the United States. And, and uh, as a real benefit to us, they did it. They they did these abrasion tests, like that that you mentioned earlier. It simulated somebody walking or driving or or um, running on these surfaces um, thousands and thousands of times or, or thousands of hours in a very short amount of time. Their machines would duplicate that wear and tear. And after it passed the tests that they had, they ended up buying a machine from us. Wow. Um, so that was that was one of the, the, the best endorsements we could have had because they provided testing with materials that we did not have the benefit of owning ourselves um, that answered the very question you asked. Um, so uh, and since then, we've sold 10 floor printers. Eight of them were, are to companies that were in the flooring business. Um, two of them were people who wanted to just have a wall printer and floor printer and just have both machines when they started their business to be able to cover all areas and opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, but that's uh, but the floor printer is a cool machine. Um, it, it does. Uh, we have a, a couple of tapestries that we put like a flying carpet. We put on the wall on the floor in our warehouse here. Uh, that's been down for about a year now, um, and it's been driven over and walked on. Um, you can coat those also, just like I described for an outdoor exterior wall printing. You can cover mm -hmm. it over with or seal the concrete first before applying it, and then to make sure that it's smooth and and uh, the inks will adhere properly. And then once you're finished, you could put an additional sealer coat on with a clear coat water-based polyurethane spray um, to give it extra resilience and coating, but all doable. Can they print on blacktop? You can print on blacktop. Um, I'm trying to, and the reason I'm hesitating, I'm trying to think if, I, if we've done that. Um, like black, I guess, Either way, I guess to me it doesn't matter, but it's just There's curiosity. No surface more you less. cannot print on, but I do not have the experience to say how it holds up on a black top. Okay, because I mean it's oil based, whatever. I don't know if your inks are oil or water. They are oil based. Yes, they okay. are. They okay. give a they give a, um, a an acrylic kind of hard coat finish, just like an oil painting might on a canvas. Gotcha. Because I learned, I guess the hard way, that asphalt is not the most structurally sound material. <laughs> Because it is malleable, it moves. We've, yeah. had, we've had customers come in with, with uh, gym mats um, and oh. things like that. So again, well, it's not apples to apples like asphalt and black topping surfaces, right. but it is a malleable surface. Mm -hmm. And so some that were the very hard compressed um, gym mats work beautifully, but others that were very soft um, and mm -hmm. the vinyl um, was very... Um, I guess soft is the, is the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the ink cracked. Um, gotcha. And, and once okay. it dried, it cracked 
even if it was, uh, even if you put protective coating on, um, mm -hmm. still that, that flexibility was not conducive to this. Right, I get it. And this is not a, this is not a direct to Garmin print. That's more what that application would be for. I sure. won't say it's for asphalt. Um, that might be just what they use today by painting, um, you know, with different types of inks that are flexible. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what would be required of this. And you can't, you can't use these types of variations of inks in our printer. We had other customers come in with discos. Um, they had uh, um, discos, meaning nightclubs. And okay. they, wanted, they wanted to use a phosphorescent ink to be able to put on the walls oh, in wow. a black lighting situation. <laughs> that's cool. And that's a really cool idea and a great application. But of course, once you, once you were to do that, if we were to find inks that would work with our print heads that were phosphorescent, you certainly couldn't swap back and forth the inks. That mm -hmm. would be the only ink you'd be able to use. And we never went forward with testing it. And do you, when you replace the print heads, is the whole two print head assembly or is it just the print head itself? It's a little print head that's like, you know, two inches by three inches. Okay. Um, it's a, it, it's a metal um, abject encased in plastic that then gets inserted and there are ink dampers behind it that hold the inks that come gotcha. through from gravity fed, yep. as we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. from the ink reservoirs into the ink dampers and then into the ink itself. Gotcha. The, okay. Uh, Print itself. Yeah, I'm just, oh my gosh, I'm jogging my memory from, uh, <laughs> uh, I want to say it was an Epson machine. Uh, it was a poster printer, essentially, where you, you could actually, I had a client that had three sets. It was a whole print head tube assembly because it would switch between UV ink for outdoor stuff and other ink that had crazy neon colors. And yeah, that's it like was I interesting. Was whole the assemblies person. that they're changing. Yeah. No, you don't do that with this printer. All right. Is it, it is interesting as well. You guys have CMYK and white um, versus, I don't know if any of these other printers have like light magenta, light cyan, stuff like that, or if they're so, all CMYK. Okay. So now, now we're not talking about UV inks and, and we actually haven't talked up to this point. We do have another whole line of printers that are water-based ink, which oh. are only used for indoor surfaces and porous surfaces like okay. wallboard or brick or cement. And the, the advantage of water-based ink, which does have light cyan, light magenta, um, those are water-based inks that dry in the air. Um, and it takes a couple of hours for those to dry, just like paint would dry. Mm -hmm. The disadvantage is that the colors are not as brilliant as the oil-based colors. Mm -hmm. um, the disadvantage is that they, uh, and they don't dry instantly like the U with the UV um, lamps that dry the UV inks instantly as it's printing. The advantage of the water-based inks is that they print much quicker. So we, oh. have, we actually have single, two, and four head printers um, for water-based inks, which do not use white. You can only use CMYK with the water-based inks so that you don't print, because you don't print on glass with them. You don't print... Um, mm -hmm. um, you can print on dark surfaces, but it, again, you don't get the benefit of the white behind it to mm -hmm. pop out those inks. And the inks are a duller finish, like a matte finish um, when you've printed them, um, but they print much faster. The single head printer prints at about 80 square feet per hour. The two head printer prints at about 200 square feet per hour. And the wow. four head printer prints at about 350 to 400 square feet per hour. So you can, you can wow. print uh, literally 10 to 20 times faster. So this, this image with a water-based ink printer that took two, and two hours to print with the UV ink at 15 to 20 square feet per hour mm -hmm. would, would print at about 10 to 15 minutes with a water-based ink printer. Oh, call that but it, is would not, it would not look as bright. The colors would not be as bright. As right. Just like so so what, we do, what we do color. tell people though, if you've grown your business, you buy the UV ink printer first. And the main reason is because the results are more brilliant and you, it doesn't eliminate any potential customer with any surface. You can print on any surface indoors or outdoors with the UV ink printers. But when you've grown your business or you have a business that's only doing indoor printing and really large murals, like uh, some customers have, they do event spaces and they do really large murals in event spaces or airports, um, gymnasiums at schools, you know, mm -hmm. that's your market then you might consider a, a water-based ink printer. All right. Interesting. I suppose, especially an airport, if you're just printing an advertisement or something like that. Yeah, and you're going to change swap it. it out. You know, you're going to primer over the wall and start again. Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's a good example of how maybe a water-based ink printer might, might sure. be beneficial. Interesting. We don't have a ton of time left here, Paul. So I want to talk to you really quick about the business side. What do you see your business doing in the next, we'll call it five years? 
Well, my goal long, for, yeah. in the next <laughs> five years is is what it was when I started. I want to I want to create a thousand new businesses. Um, that's the reason that why. And when I say that, we you know we're in a country here in the U.S. God willing, after the pandemic kind of subsides a bit and flu and everything else that's out there that hurts people, um, medically speaking. Um, we don't have to get into the politics and yeah, the right. gun, gun control and any of that kind of stuff. But but hopefully there's still 300 million people here. And uh, and and with 300 million, I looked I looked at the U.S. market, even though I also service Canada, which has a market of 25 million people in every country in South America we service and the Caribbean and Puerto Rico. Um, so these are all markets we service. But looking at the U.S. market of 300 million, I looked at it and I said, after doing a lot of research on how people were succeeding with this with wall printing. Um, I looked at a market of about 300,000 people. That's the exclusive territory minimum we provide to people for a fee, um, a fee of $10,000 to be the exclusive printer um, in a market of 300,000 people. So if my business grows the way that I want it to, and to answer your question, my goal in five years is to have, in the five to 10 year period, is to have 1,000 customers, 1,000 territories sold. And that 1,000 at 300,000 per territory, that's the 300 million people that are in the United States. That's All the right. mathematical method to my madness of how <laughs> I came up with those numbers. All um, right. We know, that an, we know that a territory of 300,000 people properly marketed will support three to five wall printing machines. And that's my business to sell, service, and support our wall printers with growth in machine purchases. We obligate somebody to take a 300,000 territory population wise, and we obligate them to purchase three machines over a three year period of time. One machine initially when they start their business, take two years without us selling to anybody else, purchase a second machine, and then purchase a third machine in your three years. And that's the end of all your obligations. And that territory is yours. We never sell it to anybody else. It's up to you how to grow that market. Um, and we know that it can support that. So with that said, that's my business model and, and what I'm looking for in the future. Uh, right. right now, after two years of just starting this and introducing it, as I mentioned earlier, we're selling about one to two every week. So next year, we'll probably we have 110 now in our first two and a half years in business. Next year, I'm hoping to add another 100. Um, my goal within the first four years, five years, is to have between 250 and 400 businesses and then longer term, 1,000. That is cool. That's impressive. Well, Paul, well, you're well on your way. It sounds like it. I mean, if you well, we, like we're, we're enjoying it. We, we think our customers that use our machines that didn't just buy it to put it in a closet somewhere. Uh, the ones that are really using the machines and making money um, are happy with the results. So are their customers who see the, the artwork that's being created by these machines mm -hmm. um, and the artists. It's helping them get their artwork onto walls a little bit faster, a little bit more reliably, allowing them to do what they do as graphics artists or or artists, um, mm -hmm. they create the images that they want to, what they want to produce. And they can and let all machines it. do it. Yeah, it's repetitive. That's cool. Very impressive. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Paul. Thank you, James. It was a pleasure talking with you and your audience. Yeah. Can you tell us just really quick, how can people find you? Yeah. So, so I, I, re I really don't want these, these, I hope people took out of this something more than just the wall printer. Um, my background, um, I, I'm a mentor at the local university. Uh, here in North Carolina, the University of North Carolina, and their Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I do a lot of give back. I teach workshops at the, at the college on sales and marketing. Um, I really like helping companies grow. So if people want to reach out and connect with me, LinkedIn is the best way to do that. Uh, you can do a search for Paul Barron, and I'm sure you'll find me. Um, once you look at the profile, you'll see which one is me, I'm sure. Um, if you do have an interest in the wall printer and want to learn more about it, just go to our website, thewallprinter.com. As I mentioned very early on in this conversation, 15 to 30 seconds on our website will show you videos and teach you all you need to know about it. But if you want to really move forward and learn more about the business opportunity, there's a contact us page. You fill out the form. We send you information. We arrange a Zoom call with you just like this to answer questions you have and talk about how you can be a wall printer in your local market. That is cool. Impressive. I love what you got going on. Thanks, James. Really appreciate this. This has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. We are locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie. If you're listening or watching this on the web, you can do us a huge favor, share it, give it a big old thumbs up, and of course, comment with any questions or anything cool, pictures that you want to have printed on the wall. Man, the 
the the limits are endless, right? <laughs> For all of Just us. Trying Thank to you. think, man. You can have all kinds of cool pictures. The Ferrari in the garage, whatever. <laughs> My name is James Kiedemann and Authentic Business Adventures is brought to you by Calls on Call, offering call answering and reception of services for service businesses across the country on the web at callsoncall.com. And of course, the Bold Business Book, a book for the entrepreneur and all of us, available wherever fine books are sold. We'd like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, as well as our guest, Paul Barron, the founder and CEO of The Wall Printer. Paul, can you tell us that website one more time? thewallprinter.com T-H-E in front of it thewallprinter.com gets you to our website and Paul Barron gets you to me on LinkedIn perfect doesn't get easier than that past episodes can be found morning, noon, and night the podcast link found at drawincustomers.com thank you for listening we'll see you next week I want you to stay awesome and if you do nothing else enjoy your business